Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracina Wines. I am your host, Lori, and oh man, I am happy, happy, happy today because I have Cab Franc in my hand, and I have Marissa Deneen from Yakima Valley, Deneen Vineyards. So welcome, and I should have asked, is it Deneen? Should I, am I saying it correctly? You said it absolutely perfectly, Lori. Perfect. So welcome. And look at this beautiful bottle of Cab Franc. So welcome. I am so happy to be able to sit down and um, talk Cab Franc with you. So welcome. Well, I always love to talk Cab Franc. So looking forward to the conversation. And so let's start off. My first question is always the same, you know, no matter who I'm talking to. I need to know the origin story. So how did you get into wine? I know there's like kind of a family history there, but so how did you get into wine? So me personally, my parents started the winery 21 years ago, and it was always a magnet for me and my nuclear family to come back. Um, I've always felt very rooted there, um, just being amongst the vines, seeing the beautiful views that we have over the vineyard, the valley, and the mountains in the background. And when I left my banking career, um, gosh, I don't even know how many years ago now, at the end of the financial crisis, I was looking for something to do. And I was toying with art history. I was living in Amsterdam at the time. And then I decided to enroll in Washington State University's Viticulture and Enology program. So they have a wonderful program that you can do via distance learning with labs actually on site in their fabulous wine science center in Richland, Washington. And so I did that and learned all about the science from the ground up, really. So the academic side, but of course I was living in Europe. So I got the, at the same time, the romantic side of wine. So I was fortunate enough to be able to travel to Spain, which I know that you've just been to. Yes, Um, I've been to France many times because my husband is in fact French and oh. hails from close to Saint Emilion, um, oh. which is very important <sighs> place in this conversation. Yes, um, and Italy as well. So really, have had that opportunity, and so this is really tying it together with a bow. Wow, I you know I had the the honor of uh, going to Bordeaux for um, the, my blog had won the Melissa May award. And that was my reward or my award was to go to Bordeaux during on premier week. And it was an experience that I will never forget, but to top it off, like walking down the streets of St. Emilion, like I, I, I would like, my heart was beating. I was getting chills. Like there's just something about St. Demion that is special, at at least to me, you know, and it just the beauty of it and the cobblestone streets and everything. It's just amazing there. I think it's like Disneyland for wine lovers. Yes. It it has that that kind of mystique as well with the castle and all. So it's very romantic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible place. And I hope to be able to go back um, as many times, you know, I, I, if anybody said, would you like to go to, and I would, sure, like, I'm going, sign me up. I'm ready to go there. I would go every day if I could. <laughs> it's a great, it is a great place. Absolutely. Okay. So I cut you off. I'm sorry. So you, you were studying in Europe, but through Washington. Through Washington. And then ultimately my kind of travels and professional career brought me back to Washington And so in 2020, I actually took over the family vineyard and winery. And with that, um, putting my mark on it, looking to the heritage, which I'm very proud that my parents did so much to lay the foundation, and then also looking to the next chapter. Absolutely. And, you know, I have a question because your parents found it and it was an apple orchard. Yes. So how did they were like, all right, this is an apple orchard, but this is going to be good for a vineyard. How do you go from apple orchard to vineyard? 
Well, it's so funny that you asked that, Lori, because we are also a certified sustainable vineyard. Um, we've been certified sustainable under the Lodi rules for a few years now. And this is the first year of Washington sustainability program. So they interviewed us for that and they asked the exact same question, <laughs> <laughs> which they said, what consultants did you use when you set up the vineyard? And we looked at them like deer in headlights and said, well, there were no consultants in Washington state at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So really we triangulated um, a couple things. First, we got comfort that tree fruit was growing on the site. So successful crops. Um, the second was there were some newly established vineyards um, in the neighborhood. So Andrew Wills, two blondes is our next door neighbor as is the Sheridan Vineyard. And so just knowing that there were other vines growing, producing successful wine, um, really that's how we got the comfort. And of course, you know, the other due diligence, like some soil samples and making sure we didn't have any nematodes and most importantly that we had water rights. Oh, that's a biggie. <laughs> Indeed, especially in Washington. <laughs> yes, that is a biggie. But you know, I there's a lot of wineries that have a state vineyard. So a lot of vineyards that actually did start as orchards. So there, there must be something that, like you were saying, if the apples can grow or the fruit can grow, it has to be good soil because you're getting productive fruit. Right. Absolutely. And I actually don't know the pH. I should know this, that apples are best suited to the soil pH. But I do know we, that's one of the things that we tested. And as you probably know, wine grapes like to have a pretty basic pH. And we have one of 7.3, which is spot on for them to get maximum nutrients out of the soil. So good choice. <laughs> so indeed. Good choice. Indeed. Now, did you, do you also um, have, do you keep the apples, any of the apple orchard? Is it still there? Or did the whole thing get replanted to vineyard? Yeah, the, we have two that are more ornamental, but okay. everything else is now um, is now vines. And we have many commercial orchards in the neighborhood as well. And just for pest management and such, um, we we don't like to keep any of the apples. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Because um, I know there's a couple of uh, wineries like in the New York State area that actually produce wine and cider and things like that. So it's like kind of a dual thing. And it's, I guess it's sort of a similar path, but you know, you've got to keep that stuff separate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think because our, our neighbor manages it very separately, um, we just try not to vector anything towards him. I think if we were looking at both under our, our own umbrella, we probably would do it differently, but who knows? Oh. For, right. now, for now, we, we get a lot of free apples, which is always a bonus. <laughs> a lot of apple pie. A lot of apple pie. A lot of apple pie. And there's nothing like an apple picked right off the tree. That Yes, I have to agree with that. I I love apples off of the tree. Not that big of a fan of an apple that I'm buying at a store. Yeah. Farmer's no. market, I'll take it. But like a, a grocery store, ugh, I'm not a fan of those. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So now all of the vineyards are actually named after family members. So I'm curious, what happens if another family member pops up? Well, we're always on the lookout for <laughs> great sites. So, um, you know, the next generation are all teenagers. So I think we have a few years, you but, you know, we can always plan future cast that one. <laughs> and how many acreage do you have now? So we have 95 acres, wow. 75 of which is under vine and 12 of which is planted with Cab Franc. 12 Cab Franc, baby. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. That's a, that's a pretty large portion. So indeed. And we, we specialize in Bordeaux and Rhone varietals. Okay. So we grow all five of the, um, of the big, the big, um, Bordeaux varietals, um, we have an equal amount of Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. And then our next largest is Syrah. And then we're back to Merlot. Oh, so, wow. Okay. 
So right. yeah, but all, all around, you know, 10, 12 acres of those top four. Beautiful. And do you produce um, single varietals of all of the Bordeaux? Like, do you have a Petit we Verdot? We do. We do, have not done one of Petit Verdot ourselves, but we, in addition to making our own wine, we actually sell grapes to other winemakers as well. And a couple of our winemaker partners have made a single varietal PV, oh, so, okay. which, is, which is lovely. Um, historically, we haven't been able to get that grape as ripe in okay. Washington. Uh, the last three years, though, um, we've had some pretty hot summers. And I can say that that, that grape makes a beautiful single varietal. Wonderful. And now there's something about a black truck with your, with your vineyard. So what, tell us the story of the black truck and its meaning to Deneen Vineyards. Yes, absolutely. So my father grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. So that's kind of the, the grassroots of Deneen Vineyards. And he was a child of the second world war. And when he was a young kid, one of his defining moments of his life was in 1951, his father got a, a truck. It was a Chevy 1950. And at that time, it was similar to what we're going through now post COVID. There were a lot of supply chain challenges. And so they were on a wait list for a truck for quite some time. And you can imagine operating a farm without trucks and tractors and all that kind of stuff is not easy. So the whole family really celebrated when that truck came and we carry that forward with us now. Is do you just is the truck there or is it just the image of the truck? No, the truck is there. It's the, actually a replica. It's not okay. the actual 1950 Chevy, but it's it's another oh. a, a a different one that okay. came to the West Coast. Okay. That's awesome. I I love when there's so much tribute to family history in wineries. It just it just tells the story of the love of the vine and the love of wine and how it gets passed from generation to generation. So it it's I, I like it when they pay tribute to the family. Absolutely. Well, we it's very important to us. As you mentioned, every single block is named after a family member. And so we like that connection. Yeah. And so let's let's backtrack a bit to you had said that you're certified by Lodi rules and I and sustainable Washington. I have to be honest, I thought Lodi rules was legit only in Lodi. I didn't know they you could be certified Lodi outside of the region. Yes. In fact, they even certify vineyards in Israel. Oh my gosh. So yeah, so they are um pretty pervasive. So I, I'm not sure exactly how many are certified in Washington. That's getting supplemented by the sustainable Washington, but Lodi was really one of the first mm -hmm. and really set the benchmark for other sustainability programs, actually. Yeah. I, when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I've, I, this entire time, I always thought Lodi rules was their own regulation of themselves. And I, they were always so um, on the forefront, you know, they didn't just accept what was basic, they made it go further. So I always appreciated what they did, but I always thought it was just for Lodi. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's a key thing about sustainability is you're always evolving and always changing right. and always learning. So they are living that every single day. day. Right. Absolutely. So, now, how does that compare to the sustainable Washington? Because you're certified in both. Correct. So Washington is really based on Lodi as a framework, but customized for the Washington growing region. So for example, one of the things that is different, we get water from snowmelt through a canal system. So we don't have to pull from, um, wells or pull from um, rivers. So we have different kind of irrigation um, things to look after. And also, you know, there's different local flora and fauna as well in by location. So it's just more customizable to our growing location. That's great. And the biodiversity in your vineyard, like what are you, you know, like 
we can have bats or or you know other you know birds avians and things like that to ground cover and things like that so what are you doing to enhance the biodiversity of Deneen vineyards well we have a lot of birds of prey so we've built several owl boxes around the property. People are often visiting the tasting room. They're like, what, what is that floating <laughs> above the vines? And we're like, that's an owl box. <laughs> um, so you build one and they come. <laughs> and owls are particularly useful in our site because we have a local pest called the Western Ground Squirrel, uh, street named Sage Rat locally. And these little critters like to climb up the trunks of the vines and eat the green shoots in the spring. Oh my gosh. So you can imagine that is a big problem that will affect your yields adversely. And so uh, we really have to curtail that. And because they're protected, we're limited in what actions that we can take. But owls, a family of owls can eat 1,200 rodents in a year. Wow. They're hungry little so devils. They are hungry and they are great predators and they really keep everything in check for us. And wow. on top of that, we also have um, hawks. We have bald eagles, which make sightings oh, from time to time, which is pretty impressive, and kestrels. So we've got quite a few birds of prey who are helping us keep things in check. And then you also mentioned the vineyard floor, what kind of uh, flora we have growing there. So we have a, a row to row cover crop that we maintain that was planted with herbs and local cheatgrass. And we keep that mowed and mulched. And by mulching that, it reincorporates that organic material into the vineyard. And since we've been doing that, and we also compost, so don't forget that. But we've been able to reduce our fertigation cost by our fertigation use by 60 percent. Um, wow. The cost has continued to go up this year, as you know, because uh, the war in Ukraine, unfortunately. But um, we're very happy that we've been able to reduce that um, that need. That's impressive. That really that's that's a big chunk. So indeed. Yeah, it's, it, you know, all these kind of sustainable measures really are rooted in the quality and continuing to keep the vines super healthy. And that's what we aim for every day. Yeah. I remember years ago, um, I was at a vineyard site and that was doing sustainable farming and it was, it was a beautiful vineyard. It really was it, you know, the vines all looked healthy. The, the, you know, the, undercrop looked great. Everything was so beautiful. The The fruit was amazing. And then you looked across the street and it wasn't as pretty. And I was like, oh, you know, what's going on? He's like, oh, well, you know, he's, he's not, he, he's not into that. He's actually still using sprays and doing all that stuff to, you know, mitigate the pests and all of that stuff. And like, you could see it was, I think that was the first time that I really saw that a happy soil leads to a happy vine. And, you know, I'm a biologist. I knew that, but that was such a, it was like a picture perfect postcard of healthy soil, unhealthy soil. And this person is doing everything naturally. And this person is not. And, you know, you got to wonder what's going through that other person's mind. Like, well, how come his vines look so great? You know? Indeed, indeed. And I would say, you know, the sustainability, it takes a lot of time. Mm. Um, it takes a lot of research. We test everything that we do before we implement it across the vineyard. So, mm. you know, we, we have to be very intentional to be right. sustainable. And, you know, we're, we're very happy with the results. But like I said, we're learning every day. We're testing new things every day and deciding what we implement all in the name of vine health and quality wines. Right. And it, it shows in the, it shows in the wine. I still, the people who care about the vines, you get quality wine. It's kind of a simple equation in my opinion. Right. Uh, so we actually met, if you could say that, uh, through Robin Bell Benkin and the 
wine pairing weekend crew. So she had written an article about your Cab Franc. So I felt obligated to reach out because whenever I hear Cab Franc, my, you know, my radar goes off and I sit up alert, you know, and all of that. So first we have to do a shout out to Robin. So thank you for that article and for the introduction, because she did also send an email as an introduction. So thank you, Robin. And uh, she can be found at uh, Crushed Grape Chronicles. But have you met Robin or is everything through emails and things like that? We have met virtually, virtually. similar to you and I. And um, I'm hoping at some point, like you, that she'll get up to Washington for a visit. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you probably wouldn't have to twist her arm too hard. Um, but yeah, I... I, she is an incredible person. Uh, you know, everything she does is, you know, full, full throttle and such great enthusiasm. And, you know, we'll do, you know, it'll be wine pairing weekend. We'll do one, one pairing. And, you know, she's got like a whole feast going to pair with things. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do that, you know, or I'm doing one wine and she's like, hi, hey, we did four wines and we're transferring, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's let's start talking your vineyard and your site and um, going a little bit further, getting closer because I'm getting a little thirsty for Cab Franc. Um, you're actually located in Rattlesnake Hills AVA, correct? Correct. Correct. So, where is that? So first, where is Yakima Valley? And then where is Rattlesnake in there? Okay, so the Yakima Valley is the largest AVA in Washington, and it runs from Yakima all the way down to the Tri-Cities, um, which is about a 75-mile stretch. Oh, okay. Um, between, you know, foothills of of mountains. So it's it's very large actually. And Rattlesnake Hills is a subset of that and we're located in the northwest section of it, um, up in the hills, so a bit higher elevation. And um and we're probably maybe 15-20% of the Yakima Valley AVA. Oh, okay. okay. So and what, like, what is your climate there and what are your geological features that make your AVA? Yeah, absolutely. So our particular site, we're at 1,200 feet. Okay. So we're, we're at some elevation. So most of the Yakima Valley and the Rattlesnake Hills have very hot days. We're not an exception. So... This past summer, our high was 111, one day in August. So we don't have too many days above 100, but we're getting more and more. Um, but being at 1200, what we're blessed with are cool nights. And so that allows the vines to kind of rest and recover and respire, which is very important for photosynthesis. Yeah. Um, and the result is that we get ripe fruit, but you get a lot of acidity, juicy acidity as well. So that's um, the climate. We have a, a um, south facing aspect, which is also lovely just to get those long growing days. So being up in Washington, our, our day is quite long, um, especially during the summer. Um, and then in terms of, um, Kind of the the overall climate. I mentioned the hot days. We get cold winters, but not too cold because it drains pretty well because we're up in yeah. the hills. Um, so the frost damage is not a huge issue. So we do cane pruning um, just out a little bit, but most of it's spur pruning. I'd say ninety five percent spur pruning. Um, cane pruning was a was a little project that we did to see if that helped with the cold hardiness, and. Um, I guess the last point I would say is we have very little rainfall. Okay. So um, under eight inches a year, in fact. Oh. So we're a hundred percent irrigated. I mean, we could not grow plants if we were not irrigated up there. And you're really counting on that snowfall. Indeed. To, to melt. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And, you know, being in Washington, we tend to get a lot of weather in the winter. And so we haven't had too many years with drought. Um, so we've been very fortunate in that regard. 
And do you, do you have specific mountains there? Like I'm horrible in that. Like, do you have, you know? Yeah. So from, we sit in the foothills of the Cascade mountain okay. range. Um, so on the east side, so Seattle's on the west side, you go up the Cascades and down, and it's much more arid as a result because the weather stays on the west side. Um, and the, the mountains obviously provide the water and beautiful views. So we always like to say the grapes grow better when they have a nice view to look <laughs> at. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I could tell you about that's unique about our hilltop area. What type of soil is it? Yeah, so we didn't talk about the, the geology at all. So our whole area was created by the Missoula floods. And so we have silt loam soils. Um, we, one thing that's also unique in our area is that we have a layer of caliche, which is basically calcium carbonate. And we talked a little bit about the apple orchard before, but calcium carbonate can be very hard and almost impenetrable to grapevines. Mm -hmm. But because we had the apple orchard there prior, it broke that up. And so that's actually in the soil mixing and um, providing more nutrients for the vines. So well, it's, it's a really interesting, cool. it's a very interesting um, geological area. You think about if the orchard wasn't there, the excessive work that would be needed to prep the to prep the vineyard so that the vines can, you know, get their roots in there. And so uh, the the history of the vineyard makes a big difference. Absolutely. And because of that layer, I mean, if you didn't break through in places, the, the soils would be quite shallow, like as little as eight inches in some areas. Wow. So okay. being able for the vines to be able to get through is really quite important. Yeah. Well, I can see your your backdrop there. I can see some mountains back there and it is a pretty darn beautiful view. <laughs> it is. And that's not even the view over Mount Adams or Mount Rainier. So, which is going the other direction. <laughs> well, it's a pretty view. I, the vines must be happy seeing that. <laughs> yes, they are. Thank you. All right. Let's get Frank. It's time to talk Cab Frog. So I have, I'll grab the bottle again to show everybody who's watching. I have the 2020 uh, Deneen Vineyards Cabernet Franc, and it's got the cute little black truck on it. And on the back, it is showing that it is the certified green. So let's talk Cab Franc. Is this 100%? It is 100% and all harvested from my niece, Rose's block, okay. which is our clone 214, which actually is the same clone that hails from the right bank of Bordeaux. All right. And it is actually the most planted clone in the Loire Valley. Indeed. So it is but a very different climate to us in the lower valley yeah. <laughs> which, which actually is the beauty to me of cabernet franc is that it can grow well in so many areas absolutely absolutely and it very much is different depending on where it is being grown so you had said that this is clone 214 uh it's there's the other thing that drives me crazy about viticulture is just the synonyms, you know, like, you know, the names of the grapes that can go by, you know, 20 different names. And when I was studying the Spanish wine scholar, there's like 10 names for Tempranillo, you know, depending on where in Spain it's being grown, you know, and so the clone 214 is also clone 11, but you don't hear that very frequently, but I think everybody is more familiar with 214. But what about 214 do you like? Why is that the clone that is the, in this 100% Cab Franc? Well, we like that clone because when well-tended, and I say that because that's a very important aspect of growing Cabernet Franc, it has less of the green bell pepper notes and more of the floral notes and red fruit notes. Mm -hmm. This is very and floral. It's got lav lavender is, um, lavender's coming out. Hi hibiscus, hibiscus maybe? 
Uh, so it is, it's very floral. I haven't, I haven't gotten to taste it yet because I keep smelling it. But <laughs> Well, and that's actually, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that, Lori, because that's one of the things I love about Cabernet Franc is the aromatics. So I just think it lifts any blend, even if, mm-hmm. you know, on its own, it has beautiful aromatics, but blending it with other, you know, as they do in Bordeaux just really elevates um, right. The, the wine overall. Yeah. So I'm getting, like I said, lavender, hibiscus, um, and there is some um, milk chocolate and there is graphite, which I love in, in a cab franc. And then it is a, it, it is a red fruit dominant aroma. So tell me more about this. When, when was it harvested? You know, how do you process it? And I'm actually Absolutely. going to taste it. <laughs> Absolutely. So generally, we harvest our Cab Franc in early October. And the 2020 growing season was no exception. So we harvested it on October 7th, um, not far from Rosie's birthday. Um, and that's, then our we... an- that's my husband and my anniversary. So oh, food well, yes. that's a special wine for you then. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> And then we um, we pressed it, we aged it for 14 months in half new and half used barrels. Okay. Um, we don't use a heavy toast um, because we do, well, especially because we're in a state vineyard, we like to showcase the fruit. And so we tend to use a lighter touch in the, in the winery. And so only 14 months. So, but I believe that gave it enough structure. Absolutely. I think um, the combination of the natural tannins, the oak, the acidity that we get from our site, um, and obviously the fruit gives that lasting power. Yes. It's, um, you know what the other thing I love about well-made Cab Franc is it's the, like we said, the aromatics are so in your face. And then when you go to taste the wine, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, by the aromatics, you think it's going to be like a Napa cab slap in the face when you put it on your palate, because the aromas are so powerful. And then, but when you put it on your palate, it's not that at all. It's, it's a burst of beautiful flavors and it, the, the palate just has the forefront, the middle, and then the finish for a cab franc it it lingers there's tannin there so that it lingers but it's not that drying rough tannin it's that like softer tannin but it, i'm salivating it's still going it's it's you know it's still going on my palate and i would also mention to you Lori, that our site we actually tend to get those very velvety tannins mm-hmm. so we don't get too much grippy tannin and I think that that's a combination of um, the soils, obviously, but also because we cool off at night. Mm. So I think it lets, you don't get, the skins are not as thick as they might be in a hotter, overall hotter area. And so now Clone 214, what what would you say, You this is 100% Clone 214. You correct. also have clone one, correct? Correct. We and do. In percentages of your vineyard site, how how much is two fourteen versus one? We have about one third of our twelve acres. That's two fourteen, versus oh. and one at one would be the rest. Oh, okay. So you act. Oh, you actually have more of the one. Okay. We do. And we where do. where do you use that? So a lot of it is sold oh, okay. and we use it, the, the other we use in different blends. So we do a Bordeaux style blend that we call the Heritage, which oh, is okay. a majority Merlot and Cab Franc blend. And we also do an interesting blend that is new to us in 2020. We call it the Vintners Blend yeah. because it's made from the three grapes we grow the most of. So Cabernet Franc, Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, okay. That, that isn't, tell, I mean, I know we're here for Cap Franc, but tell me about that blend <laughs> because that's an interesting blend to, to, you know, have that Syrah in there. 
Yeah, absolutely. So you get what I would call the elegance of a Bordeaux style blend, but you get the kind of spiciness that you get from the Syrah. And so I like to, I like that wine for any day of the week. It, because of that combination of smoothness and spice, it pairs great with a myriad of foods. So, you know, red sauce pasta, yeah. you know, that is one that's very difficult to, to pair with. And that wine goes great with it. But it's also, we do that one in a lighter bodied style. And so it's great, you know, Tuesday night just by itself. Well, this is going to be my Wednesday night wine right here. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with the, that. The, the hubby is bringing home cheese and we are having cheese and cab franc. <laughs> I love it. I so love it. The vintage, the vintage itself, you said that you harvested on October 7th. Um, so that, that was in 2020. I'm trying to think of our harvest. So you were about a week ahead of us for our harvest in Paso. So we were like October 15th for okay. in Paso, but this year we were October 1st. So we had those heat spikes that, well, they, you can't even call it spike. Cause it was like, you know, 10 days. That's that's no longer a spike. Um, when did you harvest your Cap Franc this year? We harvested, golly, that is a question. I have to look at my calendar, but I want to I want to say it was later than the seventh. Oh, it was okay. probably yeah. We were probably the fifteenth. Oh, okay. of October. We've had a very late starting harvest this year, so we had a extremely cool spring. We were wearing puffy jackets into June, which is really unusual in Washington and Eastern Washington in particular. And then we had hot, hot, hot summer, July and August were very hot. September, October, also very warm. So October 7th, it was 85 degrees, which is almost unheard of for us. And we're expecting snow next week. So it's really <laughs> Woo! a kitchen sink of weather this year. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Um, and the 2020 wasn't an easy vintage, right? Because you started off with um, severe weather in May. You had, right? So it wasn't an easy vintage to start off with. No, it wasn't. So, and we um, we actually roll it back we, ha- we had a freeze in the autumn of 2019 before the vines were dormant. Oh. So that already affected some of our bud counts. And then the weather in the spring affected fruit set and further impacted buds too. Um, so we ended up having quite small clusters and small berries. Um, so smaller harvest than we were expecting, but we were very happy with the quality of the fruit. And we had a we had a beautiful warm spring, warm summer, no extreme temperatures that year, just kind of clicked along, you know, 90 plus days in the summer, um, cool days in the fall, and voila, there it was. Well, it produced a beautiful wine. It it really is lovely. The the more um it's opening up, the more that I'm swirling it. There's more of that chocolate and more red berry that's coming out onto the palate. Um, the the aromas are just blowing me away. I mean, they there's so much going on in in the aromas, but the the palate the the more it opens up, all of those aromas are finding their way into the palate also. So it is it is a complex wine. What what does this retail for? That is thirty seven dollars a bottle. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's like crazy for, for this complexity of, of a wine. Like it offers a lot. Um, I, I, I keep, I just keep swirling and wanting more. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm glad um, you're enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, it's also, you know what else? It also has what I love of Cat Frank. It has some like forest floor to it. Um, and the, you're saying that you're using a light toast with, you know, there is 50% new French oak. I wouldn't guess that from, from this. And that, that's a compliment, um, you know, cause sometimes 50% new, new oak can overpower it and 
it's just complementing it. It, you know, the fruit is there. It's not hidden by the oak at all. Well, yeah, great. Yeah, we try, as I mentioned, we like to make sure that we don't get too much oak because we don't want to mask the fruit flavors. And Uh, now when you're harvesting this, what are you looking for when you're walking through the vineyard? How do you determine it's your time to harvest this Cab Franc? Well, it's the art and the science, really. So we start, let's start with the science because that's the easy one to explain. But, you know, every week we're measuring sugars and measuring pH so that we can see if we're hitting the mark in terms of scientific ripeness, let's call it. And then we're walking through the vineyard regularly and tasting as well. So um, really trying to make sure that we're getting those red berry notes coming through making sure that when we bite into the grape, you get a nice crunch on the seeds, that the skin pops Pops. in your mouth. So that to me is, that's one of the biggest things. And of course the visual cues of the vine itself is the rachis turning brown. Um, So, you know, we're co-located with our vines. We take a lot of this for granted that we're able to just go out day in and day out and take a taste and see how we feel it's coming along. So, um, I love that you're co-located with the vines. I've never heard that before, but I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, which it's actually quite unique in Washington state. So fewer than 10% of wineries in our state own their own vineyards. Really? And I'd say a a fraction of that are actually, as I said, co-located with cohabitating, (laughs) cohabitating with the vines. So we're, we feel pretty good about that. Wow. And then when you're bringing it in, are, are you cold soaking it? Are you using natural, you know, native yeast? Are you using commercial yeast? How are you processing? Yeah, actually we just bring it into the crush pad. We usually let it sit overnight just to cool down um, once we've harvested and then we crush and destem it. And we, we actually inoculate. Um, We don't use natural yeast. Uh, The reason is we just want to get that consistency and showcase. Again, it's all for uh, for us. It's all about showcasing the fruit. So the more we can control the other aspects, um, the more you can see how the fruit is developing in that particular year. Right. I agree. I the whole concept of native yeast to me, it's a scary thing. Like you just don't know what's going to happen. They, ha- they literally have a mind of their own and can do whatever. And I, uh, you know, I, I applaud those who choose to do it. Um, it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna happen. Maybe in the future, like, you know, an experiment of it, you know, um, but it's, it just brings in so much unknown I'm not comfortable with that much unknown. Well, and it's interesting. So this year, for example, we've had a very compressed harvest and you could have a 45 day fermentation period with natural yeast. Easy, right? And I think you might've run out of fermentation space. Absolutely. And and the wine, (laughs) you got to get that, that wine out of the tank and into the barrel and stacked up and get on with the next variety. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's something that the people not in the wine, actual in the winery world don't really always comprehend is sometimes decisions need to be made simply on space. I just don't have enough space. I need to, you know, I would like to do this, but that's just not going to happen because I have more fruit coming in tomorrow, you know? Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think about our harvest And it's almost like a military deployment because it's, you know, we got to have the cruise, well, the ripeness of the fruit, the cruise to pick it. And then oftentimes the, our grapevine customers, they're trucking it from the Yakima Valley over to Woodenville, which is a two and a half hour drive. So just that logistic aspect as well. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of coordination that goes into it. Right. And then we're not even talking about getting the supplies you need to, you know, that supply chain coming in. Is everything going to come in? Is, you know, and then the bottling is a whole other, you know, whatever. But 
you know, are the barrels that you ordered actually making it in, in time for you to be doing what you need to do and everything. There's a lot of behind the scenes that, that the beauty of the wine industry doesn't exactly show up front. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed. Well, and I always like to, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, how come you grow so many different varieties? And we often say, well, it's very practical because they all mature at different times. So right. you don't have to worry about picking everything within a three-day period. <laughs> you, know, you hope. <laughs> you, can, you can spread it out over, right. you know, a month or plus, hopefully. Right. Um, so that's the added benefit. Right. Now, with, going back to all of the birds that you have, the majority of them are birds of prey. But do you have any issues with birds eating the fruit? Oh my goodness. Do we ever? So, you know, birds are the bane of every grape grower's existence, I think. So we, we have a virtual symphony of bird, bird sounds or bird detraction sounds that we have broadcast throughout the vineyard during harvest. Um, So we've got distress calls of the birds that are problems because if they hear it's like a human. If you hear someone screaming, you're probably going to run away rather than run towards. <laughs> um, and then we have, you know, let's call it screaming eagles, but basically, you know, the birds of prey broadcasting their sounds across the vineyard and then cannons and gunshot sounds. And these are all going off at different times throughout. And then we have what we call the wacky wind machines, but basically the guys that you see at the used car a lot, like swaying in the oh. wind with foil on their, you know, their heads and their arms, and they're scaring away the birds too. So <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty funny. So is there is there anything? So I might be off on on where exactly you are, but with the elevation and where you are being in Northwest, is there any issue with getting the fruit ripe? I mean, this has no bell pepper, no green in it whatsoever. So I kind of already know my answer, but, you know, is there an issue with that? You know, we're very blessed in the Acma Valley because we have well enough grower degree gate grower degree days to get the fruit right. That's not a problem at all. Um, But I'm glad you mentioned the green pepper because Cabernet Franc is a temperamental grape. So people are always surprised when they say that. They think, oh gosh, I thought that was Pinot. I'm like, (laughs) yes, Pinot is specific to climate. Cabernet Franc can grow in many different climates, but it likes to be looked after. So like any, any French woman, you know, she wants to be looked after. And so we spend more time and effort on our Cabernet Franc blocks than any other grape in our vineyard. So we do a lot of passes to make sure that we're shoot thinning, um, looking after the canopy, getting the sunlight into the, to the grapes, because if we don't do that, then those green bell pepper, um, pyrazine flavors will develop. Because that's really just a typicity for the grape. Okay. And you're south facing. So you're getting that, you're getting that sun. You're not, you know, it's, it's a little warmer in that direction. Exactly. But we do, um, we like the canopy to flop west because we will get very hot days. Okay. So it's not Did you unusual. Just see me? I had to do my north south yeah. east west. <laughs> <laughs> so west, we like to we do the flop west to prevent sunburn. Right. Because we tend to have the hottest temperatures of the day at around four o'clock. Okay. And so by having kind of dappled shade on the west side of the of the um the vines. We protect, we protect those grapes from sunburn, but we still get enough sun in to get the ripeness. And that is, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure people have heard me say this 50,000 times, but the pyrazines are a compound that break down in the sun, but that's a balancing act because in order to break it down, you need the sun, but Cab Franc actually is very sunburn prone. So you need to watch that balance of, you know, getting enough sunlight to break down the pyrazines and not too much sunlight 
to, to give it too much sunburn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you're, you're, so you're flopping them to the West and I'm sure you're cutting, you're cutting leaf layers out just to make it kind of not direct sun. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we usually do two passes of leaf removal, um, just to make sure that we're getting the sun into the grapes. Well, it's, you're making healthy vines. So help healthy wines, healthy vines. Um, where, where can people find Deneen Vineyards? How do they, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, the best is always on the, on the World Wide Web. So www.deneenvineyards.com. So we have, you know, great shipping rights to most places. And if they want to come visit, can they do that? And if they want to come visit, yes, you can also, (laughs) the website is usually the best place for that as well. Um, So, yeah, and we have a series of, you know, fun vineyard focused events that we do throughout the year, which are great to plan your trip around, but also just to come and enjoy the the beauty and the bounty of the Yakima Valley is is a fun trip. Do you have, I, I don't know if this, I'm whipping this out. I'm envisioning you having an area where they can picnic, have a nice glass of wine and look at the amazing views, but I, I've never been there, but I'm guessing there is. Yes. Yeah, so we actually have a wonderful outdoor setting. So our tasting room and then outdoor terraces are looking out over the vines, a broad lawn actually, and then the vines the valley, the mountains in the background. So it's a layered view um, and it's quite beautiful and it's very relaxing. And, you know, if people come visit us, I always encourage them just walk out to the vines and try a berry. Yeah. Isn't that incredible that when we have people in the vineyard and they taste the, the fruit, it's so the the look on their face of actually tasting the fruit that is going to be wine is is an incredible connection to that to that vineyard site. Oh, it is super fun. So you know, if they're they're in June, it's really pucker face because it's all acidity. There's no sugar right. whatsoever. And then you know, come September, people are always shocked at how sweet the berries are. Mm -hmm. So I always say, you know, it's about 30% more sugar in a wine grape than a table grape, um, which is pretty interesting if you think about it. Yeah, that's the first I've heard of that. But yeah, I can see it. Absolutely. 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 And then, you know, so I just want to thank you for coming on. And I, I just want to ask, did I miss anything about Deneen Vineyards or your Cab Franc that you want people to know out there? I think we hit, I think we hit all of it, Lori. I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, all of our wines are made to be enjoyed with friends, family, and food. So cheers to that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask, what is your favorite Cab Franc pairing? Put you on the spot. Oh my gosh. You know, I, you know, we're here sitting in early November. So I would be remiss if I didn't say my Thanksgiving meal. So I think Thanksgiving, a Cabernet Franc with your turkey, with your cranberries, it's just a match made in heaven. It is. It is. And I think, but butternut squash risotto is one of my favorite pairings with cab franc i i love the butternut squash and that cab franc the spice that's in the spice that's in cab franc and you know those baking spices that you use in butternut squash i think is a perfect pairing but thanksgiving is a fantastic example it's there's like not a portion of a thanksgiving meal that doesn't go with cab franc no i agree with you i agree it's just it's the wine Absolutely. It's wine. It will be on my table this year. I can will, tell you. <laughs> it will be on mine also. It will be on mine also. So thank you so much. Oh, you know what? Let me just ask this last question. How do people get to Yakima Valley? Where are they, you know, if they're tr- coming to Washington, where is it in relation to what airport? How do they drive? What do they do? Yeah, probably the easiest way is to fly into Seattle, Tacoma International Airport. And it's about a two and a bit hour drive from there through the mountains. It's a spectacular drive. 
If you want to be even closer, you can fly into the Tri-Cities, which is about an hour south of us. So both locations work really well. Seems pretty simple to go get great wine. It is indeed. Awesome. Well, I saved a little and I'm not going to lie. It was tough to save a little for for the end uh, because it was so delicious. So thank you very much. I'll raise my glass and I will say slancha. And thank you for joining me on this Cab Franc conversation. Thank you, Lori. Thank you.